let's go straight away to your book because uh, we've been, I know that you've been traveling the, around the world and there's a lot of things, but this is a very impressive book. Um, there's a lot of topics that I think everyone should read, especially if people are in finance, but even if you're not in finance, because one of the challenges of society is the lack of understanding the tools of our times and as well, what is happening around us. Because there's a, I, I'm actually obsessed about three concepts that I would probably start as a, as a provocation is the idea that we have so much digital tools that you become almost like a digital obesity and a digital laziness. And I think the challenge is that these tools are really changing society. And like your title says, the great transition, the personalization of finance is here. We have a big revolution going on in the financial industry. And uh, I will just read a bit of a couple of things and then I want your opinion. So the book outlines the transition that the financial industry is going through and the concept of personalization of finance and that uses the, the story to ice trade the described level, what, what means personalization, first of all. And all this is affecting and affecting uh, institutions, markets, and society. And societies, because there's a lot of, we cannot look at one society, we have a lot of different ones. And then you have the, the idea of finan financialization of everything, which is an interesting, I would like for you to go. But it, and you have a lot of things about trends that are shaping personalization of society. And the book especially is useful for people uh, that are founders, disruptors, and policymakers in finance, looking for original ideas on finance economics and this. And then the book is divided in a lot of topics uh, that you're going to be highlighting. I will do a spin-off just about the book. And uh, you have the book with you. You can show it as well, and I'll put it as well during the interview. Thank you, Daniel. So let's start by the concept of the, the personalization of finance and the financialization of everything. Uh, and as well, what's your vision for the book from your own mouth? Uh, in fact, the uh, cover of the book has, uh, has an image of an ice cube. So I use that. I start the book uh, with that story, which is that um, if, you, if all of us remember, uh, all of us just stop to think about it. Uh, ice used to be something that uh, was sawn out of the lakes, out of um, you know Boston and in Michigan in the old days, uh, and put on on horse-drawn carriages uh, to faraway places like New York and and even as far as Havana in in Cuba and so on. And that's what ice used to be, uh, you know. And then eventually uh, refrigeration came into um, into the picture. And how do we get ice today? Uh, we manage our own uh, ice, uh, you know, in, in the kitchen. We, we produce our ice when we want it, uh, in the quantity that we want, and we use it for the purposes that we want. So what I'm saying is that the personalization of finance uh, is similar to how the ice trade evolved to the personalization of ice. That is, it's well within our control today. Uh, the the money that you have in your pocket might have actually gone swirled around the world before reaching you. Uh, is subject to inflation, is subject to the economy, is subject to bank charges, subject to all kinds of risks. Um, you know, and when we think about um, what money is and what the global economy is today, um, it it is well outside the control of any one individual. Um, and the other thing that I the underlining theme that I uh, that um, that I'm um, you know spending time on uh, building in the book is that it's not just finance that is in a journey. Uh, all of society uh, is in a journey towards personalization, um, and I think that and uh, as we look at how entire economies uh, in, increasingly uh, focuses on the individual and empowers the individual. Uh, I think we are looking at how societies as a whole, uh, society as a whole is going to be organized going forward. But in the process, I understood a lot about what banking actually is. Uh, and the question I asked myself was, uh, what about the DNA of traditional banking, the sustainable elements of traditional banking? Uh, what about it? Uh, will be carried into the digital space. Um, but then what I saw happening was that the industry was not just becoming digital, um, it was uh, becoming decentralized as well. Uh, in other words, uh, the whole premise on which uh, finance is uh, predicated, which is there is an intermediary in every transaction, uh, that premise is starting to wither. It's it's starting to um, you know uh, fall off of the at the sides at the moment. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, the all the innovations taking place in, in decentralized finance, how much of that is real and how much of that will eventually uh, replace banking as we know it to be and, and what should uh, traditional institutions do? Um, now, the, it was difficult for me to make that journey because, um, you know, what was happening in the industry was that um, all of the innovations taking place, the disruptors that were coming on stage, uh, were looking like they were going to redefine finance, but because of regulation and because of the dominance of uh, uh, the the um, legacy institutions, uh, they were also absorbing the, the transitions taking place. So then the question is, where are we heading? Uh, and for that, I needed to go back into history and look at um, innovations uh, in other forms that have taken place. When we look at finance today, um, you know, it is heading in a certain direction. But uh, there are all kinds of um, um, institutions and forces uh, that are that are you know shaping uh, where we are heading um, um, as a whole, uh, and it's because of the difficulty of um, you know you know dealing with all of these forces. Finance is a uh, intermediary in industry. Nobody wants to have a mortgage. Um, you know, all of us want to have a home. Uh, nobody wants to have an automobile loan. Uh, all of us want to have a, a sleek car. You know, so uh, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Now, uh, what happens in the personalization of finance is that the individual is able to generate his own value and and in and and use that um, token or the value uh, to interact with the rest of society. And, and also to participate in the network economy. Uh, and when the individual is able to do that, his perception of value changes because his perception of value is not if uh, <clears throat> something costs uh, you know, $100 and therefore I need to pay you $100. It's uh, what can I generate uh, in terms of value and will it be accepted uh, by, you know, by the people I have interactions with? The value of crypto is that all of us can create our own crypto. You know, you can, I can, uh, anyone can. And that's been, you know, roughly what's been happening. It's like uh, there are many different crypto uh, being created around the world. Uh, and then they go through the process of uh, being accepted by uh, the users of the crypto for various reasons. Some cryptos have functionalities in them. Some cryptos are designed to give access to, um, you know, to, to, to the user to, to trade, to stake, to do things in, in decentralized finance. So um, just, um, you know, wrapping our mind around this concept that all of us can generate crypto, uh, then the question is, uh, why would we generate that? So I go back into areas in finance where the need to generate um, value uh, has arisen. So uh, I talk about um, community currencies, for example, and that's been um, you, know, a, a pro, uh, you know, a development that has been very quietly taking place in different parts of the world in closed communities where despite the existence of fiat currencies in, in Kenya, uh, even in the US, I, I, I came across five community currency uh, uh, initiatives in small cities uh, where the city you know, provides a coupon uh, for work done, for value exchange between people in, in the little communities um, so that the community can become increasingly more self-sustaining uh, and, and uh, recognize work uh, where it's created in, in very destitute um, you know, circumstances. So now, and in 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 uh, Kenya, I came across a company, a, a, a organization called Safaru Credit, um, and they've created a very stable, um, closed community, and then they put blockchain on it and uh, and digitize uh, the creation of value. You know, so um, there are many things uh, that are true in traditional banking that are being uh, carried into uh, the you know the digital space, and. You know, the thing is that I also, uh, then I make uh, very important assertions that people don't need digital finance. They need digital access. Uh, they want to become part of the digital economy uh, and to deny a poor person or, you know, a person without resources uh, access to the digital economy is to curse that person's life uh, to be forever poor. You know, so 
So it, it, we we should not be thinking about finance as being, oh, what that person needs is a bank account, for example. Um, in fact, I'm saying to banks, I have an entire chapter uh, saying that, you know, if you are going to digitize uh, your, the industry, you, you need to not fall in love with the products that you have. And the product that banks have that they are most in love with is the deposit product. What I'm saying to banks is that, uh, you know, for, for now, for example, there are lots of digital wallets of all kinds, crypto wallets, um, you know, fiat currency wallets, uh, wallets run by, um, you know, non-banks, by telcos and so on, uh, which uh, enables uh, the, the contributor to the wallet uh, access into the community, uh, access for usage and so on. And, and already uh, the, the traditional bank deposit looks enough, you know, archaic um, and it's uh, even dysfunctional because banks don't give very good interest rates on, on their bank deposits. Um, and I then say to banks that, you know what, every bank in the world, I'm probably the first person saying this, and I hope it becomes a reality, um, is that um, every bank in the world should start thinking about issuing their own stable coin. Uh, because uh, when when you think about how stable coins have evolved, especially in the U.S., where there's now regulation uh, treating stable coins as a deposit-taking company uh, that can be regulated by the OCC, for example, um, you know that that uh, stable coins um, and and stable coins. Uh, core proposition is not even the technology, it's the balance sheet, the ability to, uh, to ensure that you have the, the balance sheet to, su to support uh, the valuation of the dollar or the, or the cost of money on your stable coin. Um, and, and banks are, you know, are well placed uh, to, um, you know, to, to provide the infrastructure for such stable coins, which then the user uses uh, to go and participate uh, in all forms of digital uh, economy. Uh, so I'm saying a lot of things in my book, uh, you know, and it also depends on how we take this conversation. But I'm going back to first principles uh, in order to uh, outline uh, the transition that the, that the finance industry is making. Um, now, the other thing I want to say is this, that uh, in order to map the transition, I also had to take a view on how uh, the technology platforms were evolving. So the thing I'm saying to the platform, uh, the technology uh, platform players is that, um, that we are now in a transition from the platform economy to the personalization economy. So I'm not just talking to bankers, I'm actually also talking to the technology players uh, and anyone who wants to put uh, banking technology on a platform. Uh, as the mobile uh, revolution evolved, uh, many new players have come on board. And today we have TikTok, for example. Um, and of course, the lifespan of these uh, players gets shorter and shorter. I mean, you, you have Amazon, which is now, is, you know, essentially, uh, you know, 1992, uh, 2000, uh, it's about 20 years old now. Uh, and I think that something like TikTok will have a shorter lifespan uh, because even more new technologies such as the internet of things, uh, virtual reality uh, will put pressure on the mobile device that mobile itself uh, is going through a transition um, into a new phenomenon, uh, which has to be device independent going forward. Um, and as we become increasingly device independent, it means that the individual uh, has uh, has data uh, and has interactions not just on a device uh, but also uh, on multiple devices that gives us a, a, a much more complete picture of the person's lifestyle, um, you know, and and uh, economic needs. And there's a lot of things here, and I thank you. You you get you got a very good uh, summary of the different areas. 